Hi guys, so today we're looking at hypothesis testing, all right? And uh, in this first slide, I'm just gonna give you a general idea of what we're looking at, but then as we go forward, we're just gonna look at a couple examples. I think that's really the best way to be able to see how we apply the steps. I mean, I could just kind of list here and go, okay, here's step one, step two, step three, but I think the easiest way to look at this is actually just to see how it's applied to uh, a situation, all right? So that's what we'll be doing as we go forward. Um, please remember that we've got a couple of different things that we look at. Uh, you recently learned about the, uh, the T, the test statistic, right? The T statistic. Um, you're also comfortable with the, the Z score when you know the mean and when you know the standard deviation, the Z statistic. So those two things are going to be important. Um, because they're slightly dis different distributions, so, so you need to make sure that you can recognize which one of those we're using. Um, the, the basic idea of hypothesis testing here is that let's say we're told that we have a specific mean, right? So if we have a specific mean, then that means that our data should have a more or less a normal distribution. Okay, if I take a sample, then I'm going to assume that my sample will give me the same distribution as, as the actual data. Um, I will say, you know, we'll usually set a confidence interval. You learned about confidence intervals uh, either last night or the night before. And so let's say I want a 5% confident, 95% confidence interval that, uh, that my answer is, is what it's supposed to be. So we break it up and we say, well, we got 2.5% over here and we got 2.5% over here. So then we take a sample and when we take the sample, we get a mean for the sample. Now, if the mean for the sample is anywhere within this range, then we can say, yes, we are confident that the original uh, data or the original information given to us was correct. If I take a sample and for some reason my data is out here, if my sample is out here, then that means that the original hypothesis or the original thing that I was told is not likely. It doesn't mean that it's not true, right? Because this is just a 95% confidence level, but it does mean that it's not likely, all right? So um, that's the basic idea of what we're going to be looking at. So I want you to kind of be thinking about that. Sometimes we do a two-tailed test like this one where we have things on both ends. Sometimes we do a simple one-tailed test. And uh, we'll, we'll look at that and, and I'll show you some examples of those as we go forward with, with the lesson today. All right, so let's move straight into it. We got our first example here and uh, we'll try to go through and I'll try to introduce you to each of the steps that we need to follow when we're doing a hypothesis testing. All right. So here we have the manager of a restaurant chain goes to a seafood wholesaler and inspects a large catch of over 50,000 prawns. It is known that the population standard deviation is 4.2 grams. So I do know the popular the population standard deviation is 4.2 all right she will buy the catch if the mean weight exceeds 55 grams per prawn a random sample of 60 prawns is taken the mean weight is 56.2 grams is there sufficient evidence at a five percent level to reject the catch okay so this is what she wants this is what she got in her sample so let's go ahead and look at this and see if we can do a, a hypothesis test. I'm going to take you through the steps. All right. So we don't actually know the mean, right? But we are going to make a hypothesis. Our null hypothesis is that she said that she's going to buy it. She's going to buy it if the weight exceeds 55 grams. So we're going to assume right now Null hypothesis, that's spelled N-U-L-L, -L, null hypothesis, that's the null hypothesis we'll always set, is that the mean is what we think it is, okay, 55 grams, all right, um, but we want to make sure that exceeds, and so that's going to be what we call our alternative hypothesis, 
So we're assuming that the mean is 55, but the null hypothesis, I mean, the alternate hypothesis is that the mean is actually larger than 55 grams. Okay, so if I can reject the null hypothesis here and I can accept this one that the mean is greater than 55, then I can accept uh, that the, the catch is greater than 55 grams and, and we can take it. All right, so uh, that's step one. The step one is always just name your null hypothesis and name your hypothesis. All right. Um, all right, so we are going to go on to the next step, step number two. Step number two is always decide what type of distribution we need. All right, in this one, and this is always deciding whether it's a Z or a T. Okay, now in this case, this is going to be a Z distribution, and that's because I know the standard deviation, right? The standard deviation is 4.2 grams which was given to me in the in the question so this is going to be a z distribution not a t distribution all right we'll do that later okay number three we're going to come up with what's called our test statistic okay and that essentially is the z score associated with the sample that i took okay so the Z, what it is, is the Z statistic is going to be the mean that I found in my sample minus the mean that I hope it is, the one that I stated in my null hypothesis, and then we're going to divide by the standard deviation. Now here, remember, because I took a sample of 60 prawns, the standard deviation is going to be the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of how many samples I took, all right? So in this case, I'm going to get my test statistic by doing 56.2 minus 55 all over the standard deviation of 4.2 divided by the square root of 60. And I'm going to work that out, and I go beep, 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 and I get 2.21. Three. So that is my test statistic of Z star. So that is essentially the Z score of my sample here, right? The sample that I took. All right. So now we're going to say, okay, well, what is going to determine whether I accept my hypothesis, the null hypothesis, or I reject it and I accept the null hypothesis, uh, the alternative hypothesis? All right. Um, so there's two different ways you can do this. You can either look at the P value, okay, which is a percentage, right? Or you can look at the test statistic, right? So the two different ways is you can consider P value, okay? And the P value is the percentage associated with this, okay? So we can reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is less, sorry, I spelled reject wrong, is less than 0.05. Okay, now remember what this is, and I'm going to draw this picture up here at the top. What this is, is I've got this normal distribution, right, which I say the mean is 55, right? Now, the question is, you know, if it really is 55, then I expect my prawns to have this normal distribution. If my value is bigger than 55, then I should be able to get a sample that is over here in this region. Sorry, I'm not doing a two-tail because I just want greater than 55. Okay, so this region up here. I do want a... 5% level of, of significance, which means that this is 0 0.05. That's the percentage, right, of this shaded area right here. Anything within this area would then be considered that I can reject my null hypothesis, all right? So that's one way to look at it is find the p-value, and if the p-value is less than 0 0.05, that means it's somewhere in this region up here, and I can reject the null hypothesis, 
all right? So that's looking at the percentages, okay? The other way to look at it is to look at the z-score, okay? Or the z-statistic, okay? Now, the z-score says that I can reject the null hypothesis if the z-statistic lies in the critical region. Okay, and we'll talk about each of these in just a moment. All right, so um, from there, we go on and we do number five. Okay, step number five is to gather our evidence to get our p-value or to find out what the critical region is. Okay, um, so to get the p-value, then we're doing the probability that z is greater than or equal to 2.213. And so we do, uh, our, we go to our calculator there. And on the calculator, we do a z-test. Okay, and unfortunately, I don't have my calculator with me right now in, in the U.S., so I can't show you that, but I will uh, attach a separate video that shows how to do a, a Z-test on your calculator in case you don't remember or you haven't done it before. All right, so we do a Z-test with um, the 2.213, which we found is our Z-statistic up here, and we should get a p-value and our p-value is 0 0.01344, all right? Uh, the other thing you can do, of course, is that you can find the critical region, which is what is the actual uh, the z-score of that 5%, right? And so you can find that as well on your calculator. Again, uh, I'll, I'll try to post a video that helps you find that just in case uh, you don't remember how to do that. And in this case, we should be able to get that the Z that kind of limits that critical region is 1.645, right? That is the Z score associated with 0 0.05 or 5%, all right? So once we have that, then the sixth step is to actually make the comparison and make the decision, right? Now, both of these should lead to the same thing, right? The percentage here, right, is showing that I have a very low percentage, 0 0.013144, which is definitely less than the 5%, which means that I'm somewhere here inside this region. I'm inside that critical region. So because my P is less than the p-value of 0 0.05, then that means that there is evidence to reject the null hypothesis, okay? Uh, if I were to look at the z-score, the z-score, the, the critical region is bounded by 1.645, so that would be this z-score right here, 1.645, and the z-statistic that I found earlier was 2.213, which is larger than that. And so that's, you know, that's going from here as I get to, this is zero, as I get to 1.645, 2.213 is definitely over in this region here. And because it's within the critical region, which is bounded by that 1.645, then again, because Z statistic is greater than that Z score right there, the critical uh, boundary, then we can reject the null. I did it again. The null hypothesis. So in both of these situations, we, all, we will reject the null hypothesis. All right. Now, one thing that should be brought up is that we are playing with percentages here, right? There is a possibility that we are wrong here, right? There, because this is a normal distribution, and a normal distribution does go out in this direction, which means it actually is possible to get those values. Unlikely, which is why we say, you know, there's a 5% level here, but it is possible that you could take some type of sample that is within that region. 
Okay, so we are rejecting the null hypothesis, but there's a chance that we'll be wrong. And if we are wrong, this is something called a type one error. Now, hopefully we're not making a type one error, but a type one error is a situation where we reject the null hypothesis, but the null hypothesis is actually true. Okay, now there's another one which is called the type two error, which doesn't apply to this situation. Okay, a type two error is where we accept the null hypothesis, but the null hypothesis is actually wrong. Okay, so we've actually finished this question. We decided that we would reject the null hypothesis, which means that we accept the, the alternative hypothesis that the, the average is actually above 55. And therefore, we should correct. We we should uh, purchase the the uh, the catch. Um, but I do want to take just a second to talk about the type one and type two errors because this is something that is going to pop up. And later, we're going to look at how do we decide the likelihood of making a type one or type two error, and are there ways to minimize those errors and things like that. Okay. So I just want to give you one more example really quick. Let's take that we let's say that we take a normal coin, right? I take a normal coin and I flip it 10 times. Okay? Now, my null hypothesis is that it is a fair coin, right? It's a fair coin and uh, that that it's just as likely to get heads and tails. So maybe that's my null hypothesis. Okay, but let's flip it 10 times. And if I flip it 10 times, and what if I get in my sample, I get 10 heads? What do you think? You think it's a fair coin? Well, probably not if I got 10 heads in a row. And so if we went through kind of this statistical procedure, we would definitely get to a point where it would tell us to reject the null hypothesis, that it's very, very unlikely that it's a fair coin. And so if we reject the null hypothesis, what if it is a true coin? What if it is a fair coin? If it is a fair coin, then I just made a mistake. That would be a type one error. So type one is if we reject the null hypothesis, but the null hypothesis is actually true, okay? Now here's a different situation. Let's flip a coin that is, uh, we'll flip this coin 10 times. Again, we're assuming this is a different coin, make the null hypothesis that it's a fair coin. And we flip it and we get five heads and five tails. What do we say? Well, we're going to say, hey, yeah, let's accept the null hypothesis, and it's a fair coin, right? I mean, going through the statistics, we don't really need to go through all this, this stuff with all the normal distribution stuff. But I think we'd probably be comfortable saying, yeah, it's a fair coin. We'll, we'll uh, accept the null hypothesis. But what if it actually wasn't? What if I just actually kind of got lucky that it ended up working? What if it's not a fair coin? Okay, this would then be a type two error. A type two error is when we accept the null hypothesis, but in reality, the null hypothesis is false. Okay, so that's just kind of a definition thing, something that you need to be aware of so that as we work in the future that you'll be able to answer questions about things like that, okay? So uh, that's the first kind of question that I wanted to look at. Let's go ahead and move on to the second one, okay? So this is a slightly different question. In 2010, the average house price in a suburb was 235000 In 2012, a random sample of 200 in the suburb was taken. The sample mean was X bar equals 215,000, and an estimate of the standard deviation was SN minus one. Notice that it is an SN minus one, so that is an estimate of the standard deviation. 
equals 30,000. Is there evidence at the 5% level that the average pro house price changed? So looking at the sample, we would say, oh, well, it looks like it changed significantly, 20,000. But is that, significant, is that statistically significant is the question. So we're going to go through the same process, the same process that we did with the last one. We're going to go through here. All right. So first up, null hypothesis. All right. The null hypothesis is that the mean is 235,000. Right, our null hypothesis is that everything is exactly what we expect, that nothing has changed. Okay, so that's our null hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is that the mean is not 235,000. Okay, now that could mean that it's bigger or smaller, right? The question is just, has it changed? The question is not that it's gone down. If the question asked, is this evidence that the price has gone down, then in that case, we would want to say, well, that means that mu is less than 235,000. Okay, but that's not the question being asked. The question being asked is, is this evidence that the house price has changed? Or in other words, that it's not 235,000. All right. So this would be an example of where anything on either one of the ends would mean a situation where we reject the null hypothesis, okay? So this is what's called a two-tailed test, okay? Uh, that was step one, state the null hypothesis. Step two, we want to state the distribution. In this situation, because I don't know the standard deviation, right? I've got a, I've got a sample standard deviation and an estimate of that, but I don't know the population standard deviation. So in this case, I'm going to have to do a T distribution. Okay, and this is what you were learning about uh, last night or the night before, right? Where you're doing T distribution. Uh, the degrees of freedom is the number of samples minus one. And so degrees of freedom would be considered uh, 200 minus one, or in other words, 199 is our degrees of freedom. Uh, the more degrees of freedom there are, that means I took more samples and the better that my estimate's gonna be. And then I do have the standard de deviation of my sample, uh, the unbiased estimator, because it does have the N minus one, and that's going to be 30,000, all right? Um, the actual standard deviation, the actual variance are unknown, and that's fine. Okay, so in step three, remember in step three, we actually found our test statistic. So in this case, we're going to do T star, and T star is going to be equal to X bar minus mu over, and in this case, I'm going to use the S n minus 1 estimate divided by the square root of n. Again, because I'm doing multiple samples, I did sample 200 houses. All right. And so this should end up being my sample, 215,000, minus what we're assuming is the correct mean, divided by the standard deviation, which is 30,000, all over the square root of n, which was 200 houses. Okay, work through that, beep, 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 and we get negative 9.428 as my test statistic. All right, we go on to step four. Again, we can look at either the p-value or we can look at the critical region. Okay, so our decision rule is going to be if the p-value is less than, again, we're looking at a 5% level. So if the p-value is less than 0 0.05, then we can reject the hypothesis. Or if the t-statistic is in the critical region,
then again we can reject the null hypothesis. All right, so we've made those decisions. So now we will go and we will look at um, the p-values. Okay, so I did get the value before. I got the value of my t-statistic, and so I can use my calculator again. This is what you were using last night, so you should be able to go ahead and find that. Um, so I can get my p-value. Because it's two-tailed, then I need to add together the probability that the t is greater than or equal to 9.43, which would put it up at the top end up here. But then I also need to add what's the probability that t is less than or equal to negative 9.43, which is going to be this side down here. Remember, this is 0. My t statistic was uh, found to be 9.43. So that goes up and it goes down. And I'm testing to see if those values are within the critical regions here set forward. Um, which I, I need to find that in just a minute, but that will be based off of the, the p-value, the percentage. All right, so we work that out, and uh, again, try to do that on your calculator. You should get about 1.11 times 10 to the negative 17th, okay? Uh, do the same thing with the, the critical region, right? You should be able to use your, your uh, calculator in order to find the value just like you did with the normal distribution but do it with your your t now to find the critical region okay based off of the information that we have the uh, critical region should be from negative 1.972 up to 1.972 uh, please do make sure that you know how to do that on your calculator and if you're not quite sure then send me an email let me know uh, and and do watch the video I will like I say I will post one here shortly that hopefully will will help you through those steps of finding the T statistic uh, sorry the the critical region on on your calculator um, so again because my T statistic 9.428 is so much larger than this then that must mean then that I am within the the critical region. It's definitely in, in the outside of those tails. And so both of these, right, step number five, of course, is to uh what was to find my evidence, which is which is what I just did. Um I I did find my my p value and I found my uh the the critical value so step number six is to make a decision. Well, it's very clear that the p-value is less than 0 0.05. I can see that right here, which is enough to reject the null hypothesis. It's also clear over here that my 9.428 is within the critical region. It's farther than 1.972. And so because it's farther than 1.972, then that means that the uh, t-statistic is in the critical region because the t-statistic is less than that critical value. And so because of that, again, we get to reject the null hypothesis. And our final conclusion is that there is sufficient evidence at the 5% level to suggest that the average is not 235 anymore and therefore that the house prices have on average changed without having to measure or check every single house. All right, so uh, let's go ahead. We'll look at more just because uh, I think it would be good for us to practice another one just to make sure that we are comfortable with this and uh, let's, let's see how it goes. All right, so last one, we've got a Fab tread manufacturers uh, motorcycle tires. Under normal conditions, the average stopping time is 60 kilometers per hour in 3.12 seconds. The team has recently designed a, a new tire tread. They took 41 measurements under the usual testing conditions, found out that the mean time was 3.03 .03 and a sample standard deviation of 0 0.27. Is there sufficient evidence at a 1% level 
to support the belief that they've improved the stopping time. Well, it sure does look like the stopping time is less, but do we have enough evidence in order to be able to say that we are 99% sure or have evidence at a 1% level that the new value is improved? Now note that this doesn't say just changed, it definitely says that it's improved from what it was before. All right, so let's go through the steps one more time. Okay, step number one, State your null hypothesis. So we're saying the null hypothesis is that the average is the same, 3.12. And then the alternate, uh, uh, the alternate hypothesis is, of course, that the average is less than 3.12. And it's not changed. If it was changed, it would just be not equal to. But this is definitely a one-tail test. And we want mu to be less than 3.12. All right. Um, Step number two. Step number two is what is the null distribution? Well, in this case, again, I don't know the actual standard deviation of the population, but I do know the sample, de the standard deviation of my sample. Okay. Um, and so we will say that uh, this is, again, a T distribution because I don't know the standard deviation. Okay, degrees of freedom. Uh, let's see, I took 41 measurements, so degrees of freedom is 40. Remember, the degrees of freedom is important when we do the, the T statistic um, in the calculations there in, in step five. Um, so that's why we're making sure to write down what the degrees of freedom are so we can use that later. Um, do recognize that here this is the standard deviation of the... Um, of the sample, 0 0.27, that is SN, right? Because that's actually the standard deviation. That is not a unbiased estimator. Um, that's something that we'll have to do uh, in, in our next step to make sure that we're doing things correctly, okay? So here we go, step three. Step three is actually to find the test statistic. Of course, in order to find the test statistic, I do actually need to find an unbiased estimator of the standard deviation for the population. Um, so since the standard deviation was 3.0, uh, sorry, 0 0.27 for my sample, then uh, I can do this. I can say, well, the variance n minus one is, e so it should be minus one, is equal to n over n minus one. Remember, we talked about this a couple of classes ago, times the biased estimator, like that. And so that n is 41, n minus one would be 40, and then that would be 0 0.27 squared from the data that I've been given. And I calculate that, and I should get that my variance is 0 0.07472. That's lovely. Um, and so I will use that here in a little bit. Uh, I guess if I do want the standard deviation, I can go ahead and take the square root of that. And I go beep, 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 beep and put that in my calculator. This is approximately equal to 0 0.27. 335. All right, so now I've got a standard deviation. The whole point of that was so that if you get the T statistic, remember the T statistic is going to be equal to, this time I'm not going to write out the whole equation, but the T statistic is going to be your sample mean 3.03 .03 minus the, uh, the stated, the 3.12, the population mean, I suppose, uh, divide that by the standard deviation, 0 0.27335, divided by the square root of um, the number of samples, which was 41. And we put all that together, put it in our calculator, beep, 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 and we get a T statistic of 2.108. All right. Now we move on to step four. Hopefully you're comfortable with this enough by now. You could even pause this video and, and try to see if you get the same thing I do. 
All right, but I'm gonna go ahead and keep moving on. So in four, we set our rule for the decision. Okay, um, if the P value is less than 0 0.01, then we can reject the null hypothesis. Or you can look at the critical value, and if the T statistic is in the critical region, then we can reject the null hypothesis. All right. Again, we're looking for things that are outside, way outside on those tails to mean that they are statistically unlikely. All right. Still possible, but unlikely. Okay. Step five is we're going to find the p-value. Ah, oh, sorry. Find the p-value or find the critical region p-value. Again, remember, use the t-statistic on your calculator. You should be able to work that out, and we do the probability that t is less than or equal to negative 2.108. This is a one-tailed, remember, because it's just less than. And so if I put that in, I should be able to get a p-value of 0 0.02067. Um, I can also find the critical region. The critical region, of course, is dependent on getting the t-value when the probability is 0 0.01. And so I should be able to put that in. Remember, that's when I'm going to need my degrees of freedom up there, the degrees of freedom of 40. So I should be able to put that into my calculator. And then I will get that the value for the critical region is negative 2.42. All right. And I notice here's my step six, my final step. I'll notice two things. Number one, my p-value is not less than 0 0.01, right? It's larger than 0 0.01, which means if I were to draw my normal distribution and here's my critical region down here on the outside, I just got a number that was right here, right? Which means that it's within the acceptable region that it could be a valid sample given this distribution. And so we cannot reject the null hypothesis. Okay. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean the null hypothesis is correct. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the alternative is the alternate is wrong. It just means we don't have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Same thing over here, right? That uh, 2.108 is within the area. So I guess I didn't need to redraw that again. But here's your negative 2.42, the negative 2.18 would be here if that's zero. And so basically that is within the acceptable region. It is not in the critical region. And so again, we do not reject the null hypothesis. All right. And so therefore there is insufficient evidence for us to reject the null hypothesis at the 1% level of significance. And so therefore the new tires are not better than the old ones. Okay. Now, could you change the percent significance uh, sure, you could do that. Uh, what else could you do to, to, to be more sure that this is actually making a difference? Well, of course, you can run more tests. You can try more things and see what happens. All right, so that's it for this video. Um, like I said, I just want to introduce you to the idea and then walk you through three different examples. Hopefully, this is enough to kind of point you in the right direction. Um, and, and like I say, I will include... I'll try to find one other video from somewhere else that kind of talks through and explains how to use the calculator to get the, uh, the critical region there and the p-values. All right, so that's it. Have a great day.